Hi everyone, welcome to another uh, lecture in Physics 144. Uh, today we have a real treat. This is the beginning of our unit on relativity, and relativity is describing how space and time uh, and our notions of them actually kind of break down when we get up towards velocities that approach the speed of light. And we're going to work in the framework uh, that we established through the course, where first we're going to describe how things move in terms of this space and time. And then in the next lecture, we will talk about why things move and bring up ideas about forces, momentum, energy, and how we actually have objects interact relativistically. So without further ado, let's think a little bit about what we mean by relativity. Um, the course to date has really used the concepts of what we call Galilean relativity which is how we relate the coordinate systems from one observer to a different observer. We've implicitly relied on this throughout the course, and we've defined things in terms of reference frames, where when we talk about a reference frame, we're referring to a universal coordinate system where we have a choice, and then an associated clock where we have a uh, choice. And an observer can have different coordinate systems, uh, but they uh, don't ever have uh, a different kind of clock. They can have different zero points for their time, but we assume that the time proceeds through the entire universe at the same rate. These are really the zero points of our clock and our coordinate systems, our origin, uh, they're arbitrary choices. We have been picking them to make whatever we do easy. We pick them so that the math is simpler, and we've relied on the idea that these different coordinate systems and time zero points can't affect the physics that comes out of the object. It just makes the math a little bit easier. So uh, what we think about is those coordinate systems and that statement is true, the physics doesn't matter, as long as the reference frames are inertial. So if we find one reference frame that is inertial, which you'll recall just means that the Newton's first law holds, uh, then all frames moving with respect to it at a constant velocity are also inertial. We developed some ideas of non-inertial reference frames, like rotating or accelerating reference frames, uh, like you know, spinning wheels bring up these uh, fictitious forces. Uh, so it, we have worked almost entirely in inertial reference frames, and then we can relate the coordinates of one reference frame to another. So we often think about this mathematical setup where we have two overlapping coordinate systems at the origin with two clocks. We'll call them frame A and frame B, and we're describing the action uh, or the uh, nature of this point P here, trying to describe mathematically where that point is. And what we'll do is we'll describe the motion of P, you'll see that it's moving, uh, with respect to the coordinate systems, and then the coordinate systems, uh, the uh, blue coordinate systems, which all often called the primed coordinate systems, are moving with respect to a apparently stationary set of axes over here, these uh, X, Y, Z points. And we used the Galilean velocity relationship that says that the velocity of P in reference frame B would be described as the velocity of P measured with respect to frame A plus the velocity of how A is moving with respect to B. So in this case, uh, A would appear to be moving with respect to B and it would appear to be going backwards, right? If I stayed fixed in the blue frame, then the uh, unprimed coordinates here would be moving backwards, and I would simply subtract off that velocity from the measured velocity of point P to figure out how fast these primed axes are measuring it. Critically, we have the idea that if the all these velocities are constant, or the first two velocities are constant, then the second velocity in, measured in the primed frame is also going to be a constant. 
So let's actually mathematize this a little bit, get a little bit more formal. Uh, we have, uh, once again, a coordinate system. I have picked P to be a stationary point here. And then what we want to do is we want to relate the coordinates of this P. And we're going to imagine that it actually has an associated time uh, when P, we want to measure P. And we want to figure out how the coordinates in this black coordinate frame, the unprimed coordinates, relate to the coordinates in the primed or moving reference frame. And we have set this up uh, before using just the mathematics of saying, well, uh, the coordinate of this object p measured in the primed frame, which will be x sub p, is just the coordinate of p in the unprimed frame. That's this distance xp. And then if we subtract off how fast this primed frame is moving with respect to this unprimed frame, uh, that gives us subtracting off this distance here. So this is the velocity of B moving with respect to A. In the previous equation, we had A with respect to B, so we flip the sign of this uh, as we come here. And so we're going to just sort of uh, simplify our notation, just say that the moving frame is going to be moving at just the speed V, uh, and so V times T. And so to figure out this distance here, we just take X and we subtract off VT. So this gives us uh, our coordinate transform. And then the Y and Z and time coordinates are just going to be the same between these two. Well, this is an exciting bit of physics because we can then say, <clears throat> given this velocity or this uh, coordinate in the prime frame, we can uh, take a time derivative of it, and uh, then we uh, get dx by dt minus v, the time in the minus vt gets uh, derivative. And so this u is the actual velocity of point p uh, here, minus v, which is the velocity of the frame. And we've been able to do this because a little bit of time in both coordinates is the same. Remember, universal clock. Uh, if we differentiate again, we can figure out the acceleration of point P. Uh, and that's the time derivative of the up minus v, so this expression. And that just gives us the acceleration of point P, noting that this v term here is a constant. So it drops out, and that means that we just uh, lose that out of the equation, and we get that the acceleration of the point uh, P in the primed frame is equal to the acceleration in the unprimed frame. And if we take that the masses are equal in the two reference frame, then we have that the forces are equal. And so this means that Newton's second law will hold between these inertial reference frames. If this V was not a constant, then we would have different accelerations and different implied net forces. And so then we would say Newton's law don't hold between these frames. Therefore, they are not inertial. One of them must be accelerating with respect to the other. So with that as a backdrop, let's think about uh, the uh, let, let's think about the state of physics at the end of the 19th century, uh, because there were a lot of people who were describing this as the end of physics, and one of the crowning pieces of uh, classical physics was developed by physics by physicist uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who wrote down a consolidated representation of the equations of electromagnetism in 1861. And this was a stunning tour de force of physics. Uh, and it, uh, in particular, what Maxwell's work did was showing that you can consider electricity and magnetism to be aspects of the same phenomenon called electromagnetism. And in a vacuum, Maxwell uh, uh, developed these equations that showed that these two equations followed a specific form of differential equation called a wave equation. So this E is the X component of an electric field. And Maxwell showed that the second partial derivative with respect to X 
for this field was uh, minus one over some mess of constants uh, times the partial of uh, the E field in the X direction with respect to time, two partials, uh, was equal to zero. So it gave this relationship between how a electric field varied in space to how it varied in time. Now this is a differential equation. The actual structure of this equation isn't something we're going to tackle in this term, uh, course here. Uh, but this mu naught and epsilon naught were just measured constants from, say, the Coulomb and the Ampere law. So you might remember the Coulomb law, uh, which is just the force between two electric charges is the two charges divided by r squared times some constant, and that constant is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space. Uh, and then we have Ampere's law, which says that the force per unit length from the magnetic field between two current carrying wires separated by a distance r was just mu naught times the current in those wires i squared over 2 pi r. I'm not expecting us to really dive into the physics of these equations, even though it's some of my favorite physics, but what I want you to know is that these are just constants that people had measured with respect to the electric field and with respect to the magnetic field. But then Maxwell comes along and says, well, the electric field, using these equations, uh, will actually follow this wave equation. Magnetic field follows a very similar pattern. And a wave equation has a solution. That solution is that uh, the, you know, there's some amplitude times the cosine of 2 pi x, that's the spatial coordinate, over the wavelength of a wave, minus the frequency, this is a nu and not a t, Time, this one's or not a v, and then this is t. So nu t over 2 pi. Uh, well, this is the equation of a wave, and it's a moving wave as it sort of moves forward. And you ask, how fast does this, uh, move, uh, this wave move? Well, it's lambda times nu, which is 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. If you go back, that's just 1 over the speed of the wave squared right there. And that we'll just call C. And you could take the measured values of mu naught and epsilon naught, and you would multiply them together, and you would get a value of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Well, 1 over the square root of their product gives you 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which was the speed of light. So these waves, these electromagnetic waves, were light. And Maxwell showed how they arise from the laws of electricity and magnetism. How fast they travel in a vacuum was just related to some fundamental constants in the universe. So this was amazing, and it addressed one of the last major open question in physics developed at that time. So we call this kind of uh, approach in physics the unification of two physical effects. Electricity and magnetism really were just seen as manifestations of a global, more general phenomenon, which Maxwell was able to describe with these amazing equations. But then it started raising some questions, which is, well, in what velocity frame was the speed of light measured? And if you measure a different speed of light for, say, a moving observer, what does that imply about the coefficients mu naught and epsilon naught? These couple, these these constants, do they vary? Because the speed is related to these coefficients. So, is the strength of the electric field changing for different observers? It's kind of weird. So, it's a big speed, and we probably wouldn't notice these changes because we're moving around at pretty slow speeds, but it's possible. So this led to the idea that the universe was permeated with this thing called the luminiferous ether. Uh, and you can tell it's an awesome word because they spell ether with a A-E. So uh, this luminiferous ether was this kind of imperceptible medium through which light travels. And it would just sort of be, on average, still in some reference frame. And then the wave moves in that reference frame. So there would be a preferred reference frame for light. 
uh, and then say the Earth's rotation and revolution around the sun and all that stuff would be moving through this ether. So we should go out and measure the speed of light with respect to the velocity of the ether. So this raises a neat little way of doing, uh, thinking about this in terms of a slightly simpler physics problem, which is the idea of two swimmers trying to swim across a river um, or in a river. So we think about uh, these two swimmers uh, and we're going to say that those uh, they, they swim at a speed of C in the river and that is flowing with a speed of V uh, downstream. So it's headed this way. The swimmer A is going to swim across this river uh, like so. So that's uh, swimmer a is going that way and then swimmer b is going to be swimming down and they're going to swim a distance l across or down their river with respectively and return to their starting point which raises the question which swimmer returns to their starting point first well let's tackle swimmer b so swimmer b is going to take a total time t sub b that's going to be equal to the distance that the swimmer has to travel divided by how fast they're swimming. And as they're swimming downstream, the water is kind of carrying them along with respect to the bank. So they move with a speed of C plus V. And then on the way back, they have to fight. And so then their effective speed measured with respect to the bank is just L over C minus V. And these two times are added together, and that gives us the total time of the swimmer crossing. And I'm going to do a little algebra here. I'm going to find a common denominator. Um, so that'll be C plus V times C minus V. And then I'm going to multiply uh, the top. That becomes C minus V uh, plus L times C plus V. Uh, and so then if we add these out, you notice that the minus V terms here and here will cancel out. So we get 2LC over C squared minus V squared. That's uh, distributing this term. Uh, nice answer. I'm going to write it in a slightly more provocative form that we'll be using a little later uh, by factoring out a C squared from the denominator. So we get 2LC over C squared times 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Uh, and cancel a c, and so that gives us our final answer. 2lc times 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so we'll apply a similar set of reasoning to the crossing for swimmer a, uh, but the problem is, is that swimmer a needs to swim directly across the river, uh, but the velocity vector for a uh, looks like this. It's speed of c, and then the river is going to flow downstream with speed v, and they're all effective acro uh, across the river speed here is just going to be the square root of c squared, that's the hypotenuse of this triangle, minus v squared. So that's their speed. Uh, when they go down, they have to, or when they're coming back, they need to uh, swim this way uh, with respect to the river so that they swim straight across. So then v, and so again, this will be c squared minus v squared will be their speed in crossing the river. So in that case, uh, TA is just going to be twice the distance across the river. They're traveling at the same speed on both legs. So that's square root of C squared minus V squared. And once again, I'm gonna factor a C squared out of the radical. So I get 2L over C times one over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. Now, the stipulation in this problem is that the, uh, the speed C is faster than the, flowing, uh, the, the river. And so in that case, this uh, V minus C term, v, or 1 minus V squared over C squared term, V over C is less than 1. And so this is 1 minus a number less than 1. And so this whole radical here is the square root of a number less than one in the uh, denominator. So that means that it will be uh, larger. So if I pick, uh, it will be a number larger than one. 
So in both these cases, one over one v squared minus c squared or one over square root of one minus v squared over c squared, that's a factor that's larger than one, but uh, the uh, case for ta is going to be, uh, it's going to end up being smaller than for tb. So we have tb is going to be greater than ta, so swimmer a is fastest. Uh, and because we are assuming because v is less than c. Okay, so this gives us uh, the answer to our problem. And this is useful to think about because we want to kind of imagine light as a swimmer in this river of ether. So if there is a frame where we are sending out light beams and we are sort of in the, uh, and we are not in this preferred fixed reference frame for the ether, then it's just gonna flow on by us. And we can try to measure uh, the difference in speeds of light along the two, uh, or along these two paths. So we set up a very similar experiment. And by we, I mean, uh, two physicists named Michelson and Morley set up uh, experiments that were attempting to measure this difference in their velocity. So uh, what happens here is that uh, we have a source of light over like this that's sending out beams. I've colored the light as different colors even though the light was a monochromatic source. So it had a constant uh, wavelength of light. I just colored the paths to be different so we could distinguish them. And they set up a source of light that shines on a mirror that's kind of half silvered. And so it transmits half the light and then it reflects half the light. It's at a 45 degree angle. So half the light goes up here and bounces off a fully silver, silvered mirror. And then the other half of the light travels along this path and bounces off a fully silvered mirror. Then those mirrors reflect and the light then uh, gets sent down through the beam splitter and reflecting off the beam splitter here down to an observer. Um, there's some light that gets sent back along the original path and uh, some gets transmitted through here back along the original path. We don't worry about that. We just want to note that there's light that travels along two separate paths to arrive at an uh, observer. And then what we do is that one of these mirrors is movable that can be sort of shifted back and forth so that the light waves are coming together. And so the peak of one light wave is lining up with the trough, the bottom of another light wave. And then the waves will destructively interfere. And that tells us that the difference in path lengths along the sort of red and the orange path here, those are going to be different by half a wavelength of light if we see a destructive interference. So this would be what would happen if the uh, apparatus was at rest with respect to the light and the light traveled at the same speed along both the red leg and the orange leg, so along both paths. But We've made the case that if there's this luminiferous ether, then the system is moving with respect to the ether. And we can consider the velocity of light that is trying to flow through this stream as the, from the light's perspective, the ether is flowing against them. And so this follows the same kind of reasoning that we had with the swimmer where the red path here will follow this kind of diagonal path and it will take a time that is 2L over the square root of C squared minus V squared to actually traverse up and down because it has to get this full length uh, here because it's traveling at whatever the speed of light is, but its distance along this path here is going to take uh, a time of 2L times root C squared over V squared. Similarly, the orange path is moving along and it is going to take uh, uh, L over C plus V to actually reach the mirror because the mirror is moving away from it in this path and then reflect and come back and meet the uh, beam splitter here uh, at a shorter time period. So we'll get a time uh, difference here. And then we can measure 
how this uh, time difference stacks up. Same as we did for the swimmers, where we consider the uh, time it takes along the, the, the sort of parallel to the flow path minus the time it takes on the perpendicular to the flow path, remembering that this first time parallel to the ether flow is longer than the uh, path perpendicular to it, or longer in time. Uh, perpendicular to it, just like for the swimmers. Carry out these differences, uh, these differences, and we find if we use some physics level approximations that the time difference is uh, the length of the arms here uh, times v squared over c squared. And then if we consider this difference in path length uh, is the speed of light times this time difference, uh, then that gives us a length in wavelengths, which we will then calculate relative to the wavelength of the light as L times lambda V squared over C squared. So the reason why we do this is this is how they actually measured it, is uh, they were actually measuring changes in the number of wavelengths along a uh, ship. And the reason they can do that is they take their apparatus with respect to the velocity of the ether and they rotate it. So suddenly we make an observation that uh, where the role of the two paths changes, uh, exchanges. So suddenly the orange path is the one that is moving diagonally along this longer uh, or along this triangular path with respect to the ether. And then the red light here, the red path, I should say, is moving parallel to the ether. So suddenly it picks up the longer time and then the orange path ends up going along the shorter time. So then what you're not measuring is the actual number of wavelengths along any given path. Instead, what you're doing is you're measuring the difference between when the ether is flowing along one arm versus when it is flowing on the other arm and then perpendicular to the original arm. So we can measure this change. So it'll be twice the number of uh, uh, the difference in wavelengths because it'll uh, switch and one side will get longer and one side will get shorter. Uh, and so what Michelson and Morley's exper uh, the Michelson and Morley experiments did was they set up a fairly long path length through a series of kind of additional mirrors. Uh, they used a wavelength of light at about 600 nanometers, and they assumed that the velocity of the ether would be at least as large as the rotation of the Earth around the sun which given we know how far we are from the sun and it takes a year to go around the sun, the orbital speed of the planet ends up being 30 kilometers per second around uh, the planet, around the sun. So this gives us our um, uh, velocities. And so we predict with all of this and uh, this change in path uh, that we should see about a half a wavelength shift in the path. Uh, 0.04, uh, so or 0.4 uh, wavelength shift. So you actually observe this, and uh, the crazy thing is that uh, they predicted the shift of 0.4, and then they measured that to 0 0.00 plus or minus 0 0.01, which is weird. This really should be here. These are the most minimal number like the the slowest speed that the ether can ever be moving uh unless you're in some sort of weird vortex of ether that only followed the earth or something crazy like that in which case the rotation should show up uh, in which case your lab is very special it's very weird like you have to construct a lot of what ifs to make this measurement strictly zero for everybody who carried out the experiment all over the earth at different times of the year, different times of the day. So the conclusion was there's no evidence for this ether. So physics basically says if there's no evidence for it and it should be there, you get rid of it. And that leads to some uncomfortable implications, which is Maxwell's equations would then have to hold in every inertial reference frame and then the Galilean transformations, this notion of relativity, simply can't be correct. So this was the beginning of new physics rather than the end of the old physics. And it led to the development of the theory of relativity 
by one A. Einstein, of whom you may have heard. Uh, so Einstein was a physicist and was thinking about the ramifications of the lack of a preferred velocity frame in electricity and magnetism. And Einstein wrote down two postulates, uh, which are basic assumptions for how the universe actually works. First, the basic one, which is that the laws of physics must have the same form in every inertial reference frame. So it doesn't really matter what the, um, you know, how fast you're moving with respect to it. As long as it's in an inertial reference frame, then the laws of physics have the same shape. The, the other thing, which is pretty wild, is that the speed of light in a vacuum has the same value across all inertial reference frames. So this is neat. It's independent of the velocity of the source of the light and independent of the velocity of the observer. So it leads to the most kind of smart ass of answers to the grade six uh, brain teaser question of what if you're in a car that's driving along at half the speed of light and you turn on your headlights that go out in front of you at the speed of light, how fast does somebody who's standing by watching this observe the headlights going? And the answer is, oh, it's the speed of light. And if they're going the other direction, they turn on their headlights going backward. Now it's the speed of light. Everybody always measures the speed of light in a vacuum to be the same. It's you know, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So that's a nice answer, simple, but it has some weird implications. So let's consider them. So let's imagine uh, a car, train car on wheels, with a person on the train, and that person has uh, a camera or a phone or something that is able to give off a flash of light. And uh, light moves very quickly, so we're gonna have to consider this very carefully. Uh, and light moves out from that person's flash at a constant speed of light in a vacuum. They, I guess, have a breathing apparatus or something. Well, that's cool. So if this train car is 20 meters long, and we have this flash of light heading out after about five nanoseconds, then the flash of light is uh, has moved out about five uh, feet, or uh, it's about uh, you know 1.7 meters from the person. And I just remember that because in the imperial system, the speed of light is about a third of a meter or a foot per nanosecond. Uh, so there you go. It's uh, at five nanoseconds, this wave front is expanding. And so the speed of light will eventually carry this wave front out so that it flashes off the walls at the ends of the train car. And there are two little happenings or events that occur when this light front crosses and hits the wall of the train. After 30 nanoseconds, the light front arrives at these uh, sides. So that's pretty cool. But the whole reason we put this train car on wheels is so that we can move it and we can send it down the track at mm, half the speed of light. And what if you were watching this exact same experiment through a glass wall on the side of the train car and you watch this go by? Well, the person sets off a flash of light and this light wave takes off towards the front and the back of the car at the speed of light C, but the whole car is moving at C over two uh, to the right. Well, what do you see? Well, the light frame takes off and then because this cart is coming up from behind and uh, sort of meets the light halfway, the back of the cart uh, hits, uh, has the speed of light uh, hit the cart uh, first. So, it happens at about 15 nanoseconds. Well, this one is still traveling here. And remember, this is baked in because you see the speed of light as C, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And then the back of the cart is coming along at C over two, which you also measure. So it splats into it. And at 15 nanoseconds, the back hits. And then at 45 nanoseconds, the front hits. So recall that in one reference frame, sitting in the cart, those two flashes of light hit at the same time, but here the back of the cart hits before the front of the cart. So that's uh, that. That's pretty cool. So 
Uh, we actually have different times for different observers. Uh, and that means that all of these things are, wait for it, relative. So you also think about what happens is you can actually change the order of events if you send the cart backwards. Uh, so, you know, is it simultaneous or does the back hit before the front, the left side hit before the right side or the right side hit before the left side? It all depends on how fast the train car is moving. So our perception of time is not an absolute and will vary from observer to observer. So to get a little more formal about this, we think about those uh, flashes of light hitting the ends of the train car as an event. So something that happens at a specific time and place in this broader concept of space-time. And the ordering of events is not absolute in relativity. So this means that people can disagree which thing happened first uh, for different observers and reference frames. So this means everything is kind of chaos right now. So let's try to lock it down and think very carefully in this world about how do we actually measure time when time has no absolute meaning, only a relative meaning. Well, it seems like light is really useful, so we're going to invent a clock. And that clock is going to consist of a pulse of light here that's going to shine uh, a beam of light out just very briefly, that light is going to fly up a mirror to a mirror, reflect off the mirror, and come back. And when it does, it's going to make a little uh, reception and say, ding. So here, i got some light waves here. I can have them fly up, bounce off the mirror, come back. And that is one tick of my clock. One light pulse, and then the little flash can set off another light and measure that. And then we can sort of say, if I know how long this is, then I can measure the interval between successive time clicks is just twice the length of this uh, apparatus divided by C. Or I could say the length is uh, C delta T over 2, just algebraically. So what happens if this clock is moving? And we have this relationship. So in this case, we have a scenario where the light follows this triangular pattern here. And like the swimming case, it is moving along the hypotenuse at a fixed speed. The velocity of however fast this clock is moving with respect to another observer is shown down here. And then this perpendicular length L is going to uh, just, uh, it'll be uh, you know a constant in this case. And we want to measure how long between successive ticks of the clock for this moving clock. And so what we're going to do is, since we have changed our frames of reference, we're going to give all our variables here a little prime to say, well, this is the moving clock. And using a little Pythagorean theorem, we can figure out that C delta T over 2 is L plus V delta T over 2, uh, where both of those are squared, added together, square root. So the length is the same for moving and motionless observers because it's not going to be affected by the cart sort of moving in the horizontal uh, direction. Um, so there's nothing in the problem that would change that. And so what we're going to do is we can calculate from Pythagoras, solve uh, L squared uh, for L squared. And we find that that's equal to uh, C delta T prime squared uh, over 2. Uh, minus v delta t prime over 2 quantity squared. And from that, we can back out uh, the parts of the problem. These two are equal. We can ignore L, the length of the clock, and solve for the relationship between time ticks in the stationary frame versus the interval in time ticks in the perpendicular or, or in the moving frame. Uh, and so I can invert this and say this is 1 over the root v, 1 minus v squared over c squared times the ticks in the stationary frame. And so this means that if v is larger than 0, say half the speed of light or something like that, this whole expression will be a number that is larger than 1. And so the interval between time ticks for a moving clock, if somebody's watching a clock moving, will be larger than the time clicks for a stationary clock. 
This is a little function uh, or a plot of this function, um, which is one over root one minus V squared over C squared. As I get close to the speed of light, V over C, uh, this function blows up. There's an asymptote here at one. If I stick in C, uh, this is one minus one, the square root of zero is zero. One over zero is mm, problematic. But uh, as we get close on the positive, uh, on the uh, sort of, you know, slightly less than one side, it limits to uh, positive infinity uh, as it approaches. So this tells us uh, we can interpret this as moving clocks run slow or slowly, I guess, uh, because the time between the ticks is uh, longer. We actually give this little algebraic expression a very special name. We call it gamma because uh, it shows up everywhere through the rest of this course. So gamma is 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, and we'll call beta is v over c, so we'll see a, a few betas show up every now and then. So gamma is just 1 over root 1 minus beta squared. And so in this formalism, uh, the time it ticks before a moving clock are just gamma time, be, be, com, times the interval between time ticks for a stationary clock. So uh, the, it's kind of interesting that the observer that is uh, stationary with respect to the clock actually is going to measure the shortest possible time. And that is telling us that that's a sort of sp a special frame for measuring time for this clock, uh, and it's called the proper time. So we usually indicate proper times or proper whatever uh, with a subscript of zero. So the time is gamma times the uh, proper time uh, to figure out how fast the time is passing for a moving observer. So it's kind of interesting. You think, well, this just mathematics, but it actually shows up. This is a real effect. And we can measure this real effect using uh, muons. One of the ways we can investigate the real physical ramifications of this is in particle physics. And there's something in the universe that accelerates subatomic particles to high speeds very close to the speed of light. And those particles get hurled into the Earth's atmosphere, and we call those cosmic rays. Those cosmic rays come down, they hit particles in the Earth's atmosphere, and trigger all kinds of weird nuclear reactions. Uh, they split out into a bunch of other subatomic particles. And one of the subatomic particles that comes out of that is something that's called a muon. Muons are radioactive, and they decay with a half-life of two microseconds into an electron and an antineutrino. So what we want to do is figure out how many muons will be seen at different points in the Earth's uh, atmosphere from where the cosmic ray uh, collides. We measure some muons at, say, top of a mountain, and then down at sea level. And these muons are traveling very fast, a uh, speed of something like 0.99944c, and so they should take a total time to go from some altitude, say our cosmic ray observatory at 6,000 meters, down to sea level. And so they should take a time that is equal to the height over their speed. And so that's 6,000 meters divided by 0 0.99944 times 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And this represents levels of precision that I don't care about. That answer is really close to about 20 microseconds. So from radioactive decay, we expect that if we observe a certain number of particles and not at 6,000 meters altitude, those particles will come down, they will decay on the way and arrive at sea level. And the fraction that should arrive at sea level is 2 to the negative t over the half-life time, or uh, n naught, which is the original flux, times 2 to the negative 20 microseconds over 2 microseconds, which is n naught times 2 to the negative 10, which is 0 0.009 times n naught, which means 
about 1% of the muons should survive, or sorry, a tenth of a percent of the muons should survive when they reach the ground level. But we actually measure that n is about 0.8 n naught for muons at this speed. So let's calculate the amount of time that would be elapsed for a clock that is moving with the muon. So for that muon, it experiences a uh, proper time that we want to calculate. Uh, that's t mu, so what it experiences, times this relativistic time dilation factor is going to be equal to the time that is passing in the uh, sort of for the stationary observer. So that's equal to the 20 microseconds. And so the time that the muon experiences is 20 microseconds over the gamma, which is 20 microseconds times the square root of 1 minus uh, 0.99944 c over c quantity squared. And so this ends up being about two thirds of a microsecond. So the clock of the muon is running slow. And so uh, we need to compensate uh, by this relativistic correction to figure out how much time is passing for the muon. It only experiences about two-thirds of a microsecond of time as it comes crashing down to Earth. And so that says that the prediction should be n naught times 2 to the negative two-thirds of a microsecond over 2 microseconds. And that gives us oh, about 0.8 n naught. So what this is telling us is that muon is uh, actually experiencing less time because it undergoes fewer radioactive decays, uh, or the population of muons undergoes fewer decays as it comes crashing down to Earth. And so this is required to explain the uh, this, this sort of relativistic time uh, dilation is required to explain what we're actually seeing in terms of particle physics. Okay, so now we can kind of think about the ideas of relativity proper, because it is kind of weird that, um, well, that muon has a clock and it's moving, and so we sort of have this phenomenon that this observer down here, sort of seeing a particle go by, is going to look at this moving clock and say, well, your clock appears to be ticking slowly. But from the perspective of the moving uh, object, well, it's stationary with respect to itself, and the other observer is ticking by, and their clock is moving slowly. So what's going on? How can two clocks actually move at different rates of time and have that be symmetric? whose clock is actually moving slowly. Well, that kind of tangles with an issue of like what happened with those muons in the previous case, which is, well, the muon is seeing this, uh, basically seeing the Earth come rushing up towards it at a speed of 0.99944 times the speed of light. And that still takes 20 microseconds of time to elapse. So how does the muon actually think that it's possibly like, you know, in, you know, actually going to only experience two thirds of a microsecond of time? No, it experiences the full 20 microseconds of time that it would take to travel uh, 6,000 meters. So that's kind of weird, right? Like what's going on here? And to kind of reconcile these things, we need to introduce this idea of length contraction, which is what happens when we turn our little light clock here sideways. And there we have the light moving forward and backward along these uh, 
uh, mirrors with a length L. And if our clock is at rest, we would know that, well, the length of this object is just uh, twice the length of objects is C times the time interval between our clock ticks. And so uh, that means that uh, T naught is the proper time. And so we're going to define L naught here as the proper length. If we're at rest with respect to this object, well then L naught is just a constant uh, value at the proper length. But if this clock is moving, and we measure the light sort of bouncing back and forth to it, the pulse takes a time, uh, C times uh, delta T1, to reach the mirror and bounce off of it. Uh, and that's going to be the length of the clock plus an additional V delta T1, because that mirror is moving away from it. And then when it bounces back, it kind of catches up and meets this mirror, uh, rushing up to meet it. And so that gives you C delta T2 is L minus the speed at which the mirror, uh, the mirror and the clock is moving. And so we can uh, take these two uh, expressions and we can solve them both for L and then uh, identify, uh, solve them both for L and then isolate the time intervals. So we divide L by C minus V over here and then C plus V for the second one. Add those two time intervals up. There's L over C minus V times L over C plus V. Uh, and then do some algebra. Uh, first, find a common denominator. We saw this with the swimmer problem, how to do that. And then uh, factor out the two uh, L over C is times one over one minus V squared over C squared, which because we're relativists now, we just call that gamma squared, because uh, there's no square root. Uh, so from time dilation, we know that the time interval that's measured in the moving reference frame is related to the proper time as gamma times T naught. So we, and we also know that for the uh, stationary uh, rod or clock, that delta T naught is 2L naught over C. And so that time interval is gamma times T naught. Uh, which is also gamma times 2L naught over C, subbing in this time interval, uh, the proper time interval. And that's also equal to 2L over C times gamma squared. And so that is, uh, when we solve for it, we see that the moving object has the uh, original length of the object divided by gamma. And so that means moving objects appear shorter and their clocks run slower. And the combination of these two effects is actually required to make everything work out. Uh, so it's contracted, the object is contracted along the direction of motion by this factor of one over gamma. And the reason why the muons don't decay from their perspective is that the distance from the high altitude observatory to the ground of 6,000 meters appears to be moving towards them and it is shrunk by a factor of gamma. And that gamma factor is 30, so there's only 200 meters of apparent distance between the top of the mountain and the ground. And so that only takes 0.67 microseconds. So suddenly we have only about 20% of the muons decaying. So that is required so that this can all actually make sense and work out. So length contraction and time dilation act in concert to kind of keep uh, the universe well reconciled. So the next thing we should sort of think about is how to actually apply some of this. Uh, we can consider an example of a um, couple of identical twins here. Uh, uh, Alexis and Bathsheba, they're born on the same day and uh, they live on earth for 20 years. And then uh, Bathsheba gets onto a uh, spacecraft traveling to Vega at speed V equals 0.8 C. And Vega happens to be uh, a system that is eight light years away from Earth. So how long does it take, uh, according to Alexis, uh, from her perspective, uh, to for Bathsheba to reach uh, Vega? Well, we'll assume Earth is an inertial reference frame. And if we have that case, the time is just equal to the length divided by the speed which is eight light years, which I'll write as C times years. Uh, so eight light years divided by uh, 0 0.8 uh, C 
as the speed C's cancel out, 8 over 0.8 is 10 years. So it takes 10 years from an outside observer to um, uh, actually observe the, uh, for the spacecraft to reach Vega as it passes. So next we want to figure out how long the trip takes according to Bathsheba. So Bathsheba is motionless and she is measuring her proper time. And so the time uh, that is uh, measured for the moving observer uh, here, in this case, Alexis, according to Bathsheba, is 10 years. And that is equal to gamma times the speed that Bathsheba uh, is, or the time that Bathsheba uh, intuits as elapsing. So T sub B is equal to 10 years over uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0 0.8 C over C quantity squared. Uh, so this is 10 years times the square root of 1 minus 0 0.64, which is equal to 10 years times the square root of uh, 0 0.36, or 0 0.6 times 10 years, also known as 6 years. So, as expected, Bathsheba experiences less time for this trip than Alexis uh, thinks is passing, uh, or uh, thinks that the trip takes. And the reason why this all works is that, according to Bathsheba, Vega is coming on at, towards her at a speed of 0.8 uh, c, and therefore the distance to Vega is just going to be equal to the proper distance divided by uh, this factor gamma, and so the actual the observed is going to be the uh, eight times the light years, uh, eight light years divided by this gamma factor, which is uh, equal in this case to one over the square root of one minus zero point eight quantity squared. And if you uh, work that out, that's eight light years divided by four. Oh, sorry, five thirds. Mm -hmm divided by 5 thirds, so gamma 4.8 is 5 thirds, and that gives us 4.8 light years. So the distance to Vega is contracted uh, by this factor of gamma. So this gives us a sense of how we can relate lengths and times in different uh, coordinate systems uh, sort of in general, but what we like to do is actually relate individual events to each other instead of having to invoke this kind of light clock formalism and uh, contracting lengths and everything. Remembering that this physics takes place, we can actually relate how times and positions in one coordinate system relate to another under this relativistic framework. And so we're going to work in a sort of specific problem setup and recognizing that we can use this uh, specific problem setup in the context of relativity without loss of generality, which means we can always kind of shift the zero points of our coordinate system so that this setup starts out with two coordinate systems here overlapping, and they want to go and observe an event P at some time in the future. So we're going to assume that it's going to happen at some specific time, and we're going to set that the time clocks are going to be synchronized to zero when those two frames are passing each other. So there is a moment at t equals zero where they agree that x is equal to zero and y equals zero. So if we have our uh, frame sliding by and then an event occurs, it happens at some time in the future, but we don't know what that time is and we don't know how it relates between the two frames. But we can set up a very similar setup that we did to Galilean relativity describing the location of this event in terms of these coordinate systems. So what we want to do is describe when and where this event P is happening, uh, recognizing that they may not agree on the times between these two coordinate frames. What we'd like to do is measure 
what coordinate the um, sort of moving frame, the primed frame is measuring for this in terms of the coordinate measured for the original frame and the time and the uh, the time that has passed for the original or stationary frame and how fast those frames are moving with respect to each other. So uh, in the moving frame uh, here, we know that the coordinate is X prime. And then in the stationary frame, they would describe the distance X prime as the total distance X minus the position of the coordinate axes here. But since that frame is moving, the um, stationary frame also observes that this uh, length here, x prime, has contracted. So we know that x minus vt uh, is equal to x prime, this distance, shrunk by a factor of gamma. And so then we can solve and we say, oh, well, x prime is just gamma times x minus vt, if we need to figure uh, out where x prime is given x, v, and t. Next thing we can do is kind of repeat the experiment, recognizing that the uh, it must be symmetric, and so that the prime frame must be observing p uh, here, and the unprimed frame is moving backwards with respect to the primed coordinates at a speed minus v. And so then the time, uh, the distance here is minus vt. And if we carry out the exact same experiment, trying to figure out how the primed coordinate system describes the coordinate x of uh, the object with respect to the unprimed coordinates, well then that this that length will be contracted and it's also x minus minus vt or x prime oh sorry x prime minus minus vt prime or x plus vt prime is equal to x over gamma and we solve but then what we want to do is identify t here so if we plug in our previous transformation x prime is gamma x minus uh, vt and solve for t prime well then we get uh okay ooh, uh, so we plug in the um let's see here here's x prime we'll plug in gamma x minus vt here we've solved this expression for t so we uh, subtract off an x divide both sides by b okay so i'm making sense and then we uh sort of collect some terms uh, and factor them out and get a nice expression here uh, pulling out uh, a gamma uh, here uh, that is, pulls out a gamma t times 1 uh, over v times 1 minus gamma squared is x and then 1 minus 1 minus 1 over gamma squared is just uh, v uh, squared over c squared and so then this 1 minus v uh, cancel with that and we get Gamma is t minus vx over c squared, which is a lot of algebra. Uh, but the upshot of it is it gives us an ability to relate coordinates in one reference frame to a coordinate in another reference frame. Uh, and we call this transformation the Lorentz transformation uh, after the person who worked it out. And so then we just say x prime is uh, related to x and v and t uh, through this expression. And then t prime is related to t, v, and x through this expression. So it's kind of neat. Um, the things are highly symmetric. Uh, so it, it and uh, we notice that the directions perpendicular to v are unaffected by the uh, relativistic effects. So this means that we can figure out uh, this. Oh, uh, important thing to note is when V is much less than C, gamma becomes one and uh, this term drops off. And so we get that the times are equal and then we get the Galilean velocity transform back. So, hey, everything works. So let's actually think about how we apply these uh, in a little more uh, detail. So, uh, Let's consider uh, a case where these uh, we have a spaceship passes by a stationary space station. 
and this is shown sometime later. But when they pass by, their clocks and their positions are the same. Uh, so we get that t equals t prime equals zero uh, when they pass by. And so uh, that spaceship is traveling at 0.6 c in the positive x direction. And at some time later, the station sees light from an explosion and infers that it happened at uh, c uh, uh, light seconds, c x uh, negative 2 light seconds in the y direction, and at a time of 5 seconds after accounting for the light travel time to get to the station. What would the coordinates for the spaceship infer for this explosion, recognizing that they were the same over here? Well, that we go ahead and use these Lorentz transform. I'm going to note, uh, to get things going, that gamma for 0.6c is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.6c over c quantity squared, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.36, which is 1 over 0.8, or 5 fourths. So in that case, we can uh, go ahead and use our Lorentz transforms. We have that x prime is gamma times x minus vt uh, for the x coordinate. Uh, we just plug in and say x prime is equal to gamma, which we calculate as 5 fourths, times x. That's uh, 6 light seconds, so 6 c dot s minus 0.6 c times uh, the time interval, which is 5 seconds. And so that term is 5 fourths times 3 light seconds, or 15 fourths light seconds. Uh, y prime is the same. It's not in the direction of motion, so that's just the value given in the problem. Now it's 2 c dot s. And then the time coordinate is gamma times the time in the unprimed coordinate system minus vx over c squared so that's equal to five fourths times the time which is five seconds minus v 0.6 c times the position six c seconds in the x coordinate over c squared all those c squareds cancel out and i get an answer of uh seven fourths of a second. That's all the math goes up. So, oh, sorry, five fourths light seconds. And so our coordinates of the event for the moving spaceship are five fourths CS, negative two light seconds, and then seven fourths seconds. All right, pretty cool. So now we can relate these uh, coordinate systems here. So let's um, actually think about uh, this in the case where there are two events that we want to know. So in this case, uh, secret physics agent uh, Marie Heisenberg uh, flees from engineering ghoul at a speed of 15 17 C along the positive X axis for uh, the ghoul. They um, set their clocks to agree at T equals T prime equals zero when they pass by. So we're setting up our standard problem when we do this. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, the nemesis has set up two bombs to explode. Uh, according to Agent H, the first explosion occurs at 2C.S, uh, 2 light seconds, at a time of 5 seconds, and the second occurs at 6 light seconds, uh, plus 6 light seconds, at a time of 25 uh, light seconds. So what we'd like to know is uh, what does the uh, engineering ghoul, uh, e.g., uh, measure for the spatial interval and the time intervals between these uh, two explosions. So this is a case where Marie Heisenberg is moving, uh, but uh, we uh, is the moving one, but we have the events measured in those cases. So we need to use the inverse Lorentz transforms for this problem. Uh, first thing, first order of business is that gamma of 15 seventeenths c is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus 15 over 17 squared times c squared over c squared. Those things cancel out. And this comes out as 17 eighths. These are Pythagorean triplet numbers that have been selected, like uh, here, so 8, 15, 17. So uh, we get, you know, a few kind of 
clean uh, numbers in this case. And uh, in this case, we need to use the inverse transform to figure out what the stationary observer is seeing. So x is equal to x prime, uh, or sorry, x is equal to gamma times x prime plus vt uh, prime. And so then that's 17 eighths times. Uh, for the first event, that's uh, 2 light seconds plus 0, oh, sorry, that's uh, 15 seventeenths C uh, times the time interval, which is 5 seconds. And uh, you work that all out, you get 49 eighths light seconds. Uh, the position for that's for number one. Uh, the time for number one is gamma times the uh, time plus v x prime over c squared. And so that's 17 eighths times the time interval, uh, which comes out to be five seconds plus 15 17 c times the position to c dot s all over c squared. And that number comes out as 115 eighths light seconds. Oh, sorry, just seconds, because all the c's cancel. Uh, cool. Repeat the process for the second event. x2 is just gamma times x prime plus vt prime is equal to 17, 17 eighths times x, uh, where x here is 6 light seconds, uh, plus uh, 15 seventeenths times 25 seconds, and that comes out as uh, a uh, obvious 117 over 8 light seconds, and then x, oops, sorry, t2 is equal to gamma times x prime plus vt prime, uh, times 17 eighths uh, times the uh, 25 seconds plus 6 light seconds times 15 17 c all over c squared, and that comes out to 465 eighths uh, seconds. So we can calculate the intervals now. T2 uh, minus T1 is 465 over 8 minus 115 over 8 uh, seconds, which is equal to 43.75 seconds. Notice that T2 prime minus T1 prime, why well, that's uh, 25 minus 5, or 20 seconds. So in the stationary frame, these two, or in the stationary frame, the time interval between these events is significantly longer than it was for Agent Heisenberg. Uh, similarly, we can have x2 prime, uh, or sorry, x2 minus x1. The spatial interval between those events is just 117 over 8 minus 49 eighths, or 8.5 light seconds uh, between them. Uh, versus four light seconds in uh, the agent H frame. So time intervals between the objects and their spatial intervals will disagree, but these Lorentz transforms give us a means to, uh, out, uh, to identify the uh, difference between them. Okay. The last thing I want to do is kind of raise a concern, which is uh, that secret, uh, so we can have another scenario where uh, secret uh, physics agent Marie Heisenberg is flying her 10 meter long science rocket just above the ground at V is equal to 0.8 C, uh, or gamma of five thirds. And ahead of her, she sees an aircraft hangar with open doors at both ends and decides to fly the science rocket straight through it. According to her charts, she knows that this hangar is 8 meters long, spacecraft is 10 meters long, and so therefore the spacecraft is never going to fit entirely inside the hangar, according to uh, Heisenberg. In fact, because she sees this hangar 
rushing on towards her at a speed of 0.8c, then the hanger is shrunk uh, to a length of 8 meters divided by the gamma factor, uh, or 4.8 meters. So the ship is never going to fit entirely inside the hangar. But little does she know that engineering ghoul is inside the hangar and sees the ship coming in on approach. Ghoul measures the length of the ship to be S0 over gamma, or 10 meters divided by this 5 thirds, or 6 meters. And so when the ship is inside the hangar, it's going to close both doors, because the ship's only 6 meters long, and trap Agent Heisenberg. So how can this be? Is the ship ever entirely inside the hangar or not? It's weird, right? Because uh, one observer thinks that's impossible and the other observer doesn't. So let's pay attention to this scenario in the case where the ship has just had its back end enter the hangar. We're going to set up our time t prime equals t equals zero when the ship as just enter the back end enters the hangar. So t prime equals t equals zero when back of ship is in hangar. So that means according to the engineering group, the ship's front is at the point x equals 6 meters at t equals 0 is the front of the ship. So then, uh, in this case, the doors can close. So close the doors at t equals 0. And that will trap the ship here. But what does Marie Heisenberg see for the position of the front of the ship? So let's say xf is equal to zero. I should say that the back of the ship corresponds to x uh, equals zero is the back of the ship. In that case, the front of the ship is at six meters. Well, where does uh, Marie Heisenberg think the uh, where does Marie Heisenberg think the front of the ship is in her coordinate system? Well, she knows that it is at x prime is equal to um, the... So, she knows that x prime is at a position of gamma times the front of the ship uh, coordinate system, which is 6 meters. So this is equal to 5 thirds times 6 meters, which of course is 10 meters. Makes sense, right? She perceives her front of the ship is 10 meters in front of where the back of the ship is because it's a 10 meter long spaceship, right? Right there, 10 meter long spaceship. So this all makes sense. The critical thing is to consider what time Marie Heisenberg thinks that the front of the ship is inside the hangar at. Well, that T prime is equal to gamma times the observed time when it's at the front of the ship, uh, minus V, which is uh, 0.8 C times the position of the front of the ship, which is the six meters, all over C squared, and so then this is going to come out as, uh, sorry, and then T here is zero. That's uh, according to engineering ghoul when the front of the ship is being measured. And if we plug all of this in, in this is at uh, a time of uh, T is equal. Uh, yeah, so T is equal to minus 4.8 meters divided by the speed of light. So the key point here is 
The key point here is, oh, made the mistake. This should be minus eight meters over C. Yeah, that's an answer. Yeah, minus eight meters divided by C. Short period of time uh, there. But critically, it is negative. And that means that Marie Heisenberg actually thinks that the front of the ship is inside the hangar and the doors at, uh, or the, the inside the hangar at negative time. So that what's happening is from her perspective, she is flying into the hangar, the door, the front door is closing. Then as she's coming towards it, the front door opens and then the back of the ship enters and then the back door closes. So that the events of Marie Heisenberg actually being inside of the barn and the doors being closed are not happening at the same time in her reference frame so that she's actually able to escape uh, through uh, the doors being closed and opened at different times in her reference frame. So the front door is closing and then reopening at negative time and the back door is closing and opening at time t equals zero. So they're not happening at the same time. The front door closes and opens before the back door closes and opens. Okay. One uh, additional thing we want to kind of uh, bring up here is the idea of velocity addition. So we have this idea in uh, relativity that the time coordinates and the space coordinates differ for different observers. So how then do we measure the velocity of an object in an unprimed or stationary frame with respect to the velocity in a primed frame? Well. We can use the Lorentz transforms here to kind of uh, bring up this idea where if we write down our two uh, Lorentz transforms along these two coordinates and we consider the differential forms of them, like little bit intervals of dx prime and dt prime are related to the tiny little steps in dx and dt uh, respectively. So we get these differential uh transforms and then we consider the ratio dx divided by dt prime to figure out the velocity of the uh, object in the uh, prime frame and notice what i'm doing here is i'm using the letter u for the actual velocity and v is a very special frame that's the how the frames are moving with respect to each other and in that case we have uh, dx prime over dt prime is uh, gamma of uh, times dx or minus v dt. Uh, and then the dt prime, we expand down here. And then the gammas cancel out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a dt from uh, both the top and the bottom and cancel it. And that gives me a dx by dt on the top. And then we get one minus this dx picks up a dt. Uh, this one factors out and cancels. And we are left with dx by dt minus v. Uh, and that we're going to identify as ux. So the x component of the velocity minus v. And then this is one minus v ux uh, over c squared. So this allows us to relate the velocity of one frame to the velocity of another reference frame. But what about uh, the y component of the velocity? Uh, well, the y component of this velocity, uh, we can formulate the same way of dy is the same. But what's weird about this is that the time intervals, we disagree about the time intervals, the dt prime and the dt are not the same. So even though the y spatial coordinate is uh, the same for moving and unmoving observers, the temporal coordinate changes. And so then we replace the dt prime with the same expression that we have here. And uh, again, pull out a dt, and we find that the ui component depends on gamma times one minus v ux over c. So the y component actually of the velocity in one frame actually depends on the x component of the velocity in the non-moving frame. And then u uh, sub z is, has an expression of the same form. Oh, this should be u x. Hmm. Okay, so the velocities are perpendicular to the frame motion are affected by this time dilation factor. And we do have to take that into account in our physics. 
and our time derivatives. So let's just do a quick application of this. We can ask the question of uh, what happens if an enemy spaceship is moving towards your starfighter with a speed uh, that's measured in your frame of 0.40c. Uh, the ship fires a missile towards you at a speed of 0.7c. Uh, and we'd like to know what the speed of the missile is relative to you. So we're going to operate in the enemy ship frame, in which case V is going to be equal to negative 0.400C. And then we will plug this into the observed velocity uh, frame here, which is the uh, velocity of the missile uh, minus V over 1 minus VUX write that legibly over c squared and so then what we'll do is we'll consider this uh, in terms of 0.700c is the speed of the missile minus the frame 0.400c over 1 minus negative 0.400c times 0.700c all over c squared and this answer comes out as 0.86c. So it is coming towards you, but it's not coming towards you at 0.4 plus 0.7 or 1.1 times the speed of the light, just 0.86c. Still probably a problem, uh, but this is how we would use the relativistic uh, velocity form. All right, I'd like to close out by just making a point about uh, the time intervals uh, between events. So I want to consider these two events here that happen at uh, a couple points, uh, t1x1 uh, in our coordinate frame, and we have synchronized frames moving with respect to each other at uh, v equals 0.8c, and I'd actually like to know what the time interval between these two events are. So we've done this calculation before, so I'll go through it kind of quickly. I'll note that t2 minus t1 is just the difference of these two uh, times. So that's 4.7 seconds minus 0 seconds, or 4.7 seconds. So in this case, uh, event 2 happens after event 1. Great. Well, uh, we can then consider when the time two uh, happens. Well, that is equal to gamma times t minus vx over c squared is equal to 5 thirds. This is uh, v of 0 0.8 has gamma of 0 0.8 is equal to 5 thirds. And so that is 5 thirds times t, which is the time of the second event, 4.7 seconds, minus uh, v, which is 0.8c, times the location of it, 4c seconds, all over c squared. And that comes out as a uh, value of 2.5 seconds. And then t1 prime is equal to 5 thirds times the time, uh, 0 minus vx, which is minus uh, 0 0.8c times the position, minus 3c dot s, all over c squared. And this comes out as a value of 4 seconds. So t2 prime minus t1 prime is equal to negative 1.5 seconds. So event 2 happens before event 1. Well, okay, we're okay with the idea that maybe the ordering of events will exchange, but this raises a great question, which is, what if T1 was an event like, uh, you know, I was, yeah, uh, when T, T1 was an event that causes event two, like uh, at T1, um, somebody uh, pokes me in the eyeball, and at T2, I say, ow. If I say, ow, before 
the uh, event that precipitated the owl occurs, that's fundamentally weird. And we would call that, in physics, a violation of causality. So we think about this and we have to ask the question, how can we describe causality in physics? And it turns out that there is one thing in the universe on which all observers will agree. And it turns out to be a very useful calculation. And that thing is that's called the interval. And the interval is something that is a relativistic invariant. In that, we calculate this interval delta s squared, and we're going to define it as c dt, c squared, delta t squared, minus delta x squared. And so then this is going to, I'm going to claim, is equal to c delta t prime squared minus delta x squared. So we can prove this, uh, and we will prove this, and we will, without loss of the generality, that's w log, assume that x equals x prime equals zero at t equals t prime zero. So we have coordinated reference frames. And then we want to calculate c squared times delta t prime squared minus delta x prime squared. And we're going to use the Lorentz transforms and recognize that uh, the we just have to calculate c squared t prime squared minus uh, x prime squared under the Lorentz transforms because the first part of the deltas where we're starting from is zero in all our reference frames. So uh, we can plug this in. So uh, from a Lorentz transform, we know that c squared, uh, and then we put in our time, uh, our time transform, which is gamma squared times t minus v times x over c squared squared uh, minus the uh, x coordinate transform, which is gamma squared times t, uh, sorry, x minus vt quantity squared. So the first order of business is I'm going to factor out a gamma squared. Get that out of here. And then we get that this is, and then I'll expand my uh, exponent. Uh, I'll expand my brackets. So it's c squared times t squared minus 2vx uh, t all over c squared plus v squared x squared over c squared, c to the fourth. Yeah, that's right. Um, minus, leave that in brackets for now, x squared minus 2vxt plus uh, v squared t squared. And then we will uh, do some multiplying. So this is gamma squared times, uh, we'll put all these uh, variables in. So this is c squared t squared minus 2vx t over c squared's cancel, so we can uh, leave that there, uh, plus v squared x squared, c the fourth times c squared is over c squared, and then we'll distribute in this negative sign here to get minus x squared plus 2vxt, and then this is minus v squared uh, t squared. And I'll notice that uh, these two terms will cancel out. That's awesome. I like that. And so then I am uh, into uh, pulling out. So gamma squared times c squared t squared. And then we will uh, start uh, collecting terms. So this is uh, minus v squared t squared. OK, OK, looking good. Uh, plus, and then we'll do, uh, or sorry, we'll do minus x squared minus v squared x squared over c squared. And then uh, from here, I will pull a uh, c squared out of the first term, first two terms. And so I'll write this as c squared times t squared minus, oh, sorry, pull a t c squared t squared out of the first two terms. 
leaving behind a 1 minus v squared over c squared. And then I will pull out an x squared from the second term, leaving behind a 1 minus v squared over c squared. And I will note that gamma squared is 1 over 1 minus v squared c squared times this mess in brackets. And so that's going to cancel out these terms. So gamma squared cancels with these terms. And then we are left with equals c squared t squared minus x squared. So that's amazing. So with all this relativistic mess, we agree on the interval. So uh, if, we have, if we calculate the interval uh, here, uh, we, it will always be the same, irrespective of whatever frame I'm observing in. So we find that in the case with an interval, if the interval is larger than zero, delta s squared is larger than zero, then we can actually have these two events be causally linked to each other. That means one event can affect the other event, and the ordering of those two events will be the same for all observers. Uh, if the interval is less than zero, there will be observers who disagree on the order of events, and therefore they cannot be linked to each other causally. There's just two things that happen uh, out there. And then if the interval is zero, it, it, they are connected by a light pulse traveling at the speed of light. One event can cause the other, uh, provided that is traveling at the speed of light. And so this leads us to kind of constructing this description of the universe in terms of the interval, because the interval kind of divides up the relationship between some parts of space-time with the others. And so we think about this in terms of, I write this as like a three-dimensional kind of uh, diagram here, where x and y are shown on the ground here, and then we'll write c times t, the positive component of the interval uh, on the vertical axis. And so the neat thing about this is that anything with an interval larger than zero, so that there is a time-like interval between them and they can be causally related, falls within a cone here. So if I have an event here at the origin, that means it can affect everything in this cone. It can be causally related, but anything outside of the cone here, it can't ultimately affect. Similarly, all of these events back here could have affected this. And so we think about the past moving through an event and traveling to the future. And any set of events or information or anything that is causing one event to the other is located within this cone. And we often describe the trajectories of an object from the past through an event to the future as the world lines. So for all of the kind of mind warping nature of relativity, the interval gives us a way to kind of understand what relations are causally what parts of what sets of events can be causally related and what sets of events can't have anything to do with each other over time all right so that was a lot but it gets us to the end of the core ideas of relativity and uh sets up some of the basic problems that we try to solve uh next time we will discuss forces and energies and work and the good news is is that once we've done this part the next part's actually a lot more tractable. So uh, until next time, uh, happy relativism.